Uh, I'm uh, substituting for Najib Radbian, uh, who's the Washington-based envoy of the Syrian Opposition Coalition. Uh, he couldn't be here today owing to the demands of his job. Uh, obviously can't serve as a terribly convincing, uh, uh, convincingly authentic uh, representative of the rebels in Syria, so I'm hoping you'll settle for a somewhat personal list of 10 things to bear in mind when assessing the awful circumstances in Syria. Uh, as CW use by the regime, the possibility of Western uh, and specifically U.S. military action um, uh, against the regime is being complicated. There's a surge of renewed diplomacy and a debate uh, in an array of capitals about the best way forward uh, at this stage. Uh, the list uh, could have consisted of nine items or 11 items, obviously, but there's something canonical about the number 10, so uh, I uh, settled on that. Uh, the list could also be different, but it's a personal list, so it's bound to be somewhat idiosyncratic. It also covers some of the ground uh, that um, Generals uh, Forrest and uh, Mayall have covered so eloquently, So, but, uh, but I'll try to keep that um, uh, to a minimum. Uh, the first... Uh, the first law of uh, the Syrian conflict is that it's a civil war. Uh, civil wars are uh, typically and uh, historically extremely uh, violent. Uh, the sectarian dimension, as General Forrest observed, has raised the stakes for the two sides and intensified uh, this violence. Civil wars last an average of seven years. This is civil wars going back, um, you know, many decades as tabulated by, uh, you know, scholars crunching bones in their caverns. Uh, have concluded. Um, seven years is a long time, and most do not end uh, with negotiated power sharing, but rather through the victory of one side over the other. Now, this is not a prediction regarding Syria, just a perspective uh, on how things typically work. Uh, two, uh, the two sides are essentially at a stalemate. Uh, in a sense, both have done much better than generally expected. The opposition has taken or contested major areas of the country and most of Aleppo, quite an important city uh, in a densely populated part of the country. And they've also taken key energy and related infrastructure elsewhere uh, in Syrian territory. It looks now as though there's an inner Syrian border shaping up. Both sides are consolidating their lines with the regime in particular negotiating village by village along that line uh, for control and influence. Three, uh, the regime has maintained its cohesion, successfully integrating uh, a citizen militia, if that's not too polite a word for the Shabiha, uh, Hezbollahis and regular army units into a force capable of stopping uh, what was um, a very impressive opposition surge for a number of months. Uh, Iran has supplied advisory and technical assistance, particularly in the crucial realm of electronic surveillance. Four. The opposition has been hobbled by its failure to sway fence sitters and continue to recruit new blood. The situation is circular. Recruits are scarce because the opposition's prospects are limited and its prospects are constrained because recruits are scarce. The lack of a unified command structure and an increase in internecine fighting has further limited its effectiveness. The lack of a link between forces on the ground and an outside political leadership has made it hard to translate territorial gains into diplomatic leverage. Rule number five. Militant Islamists have become a salient part of the armed opposition within Syria. Best estimates are that they constitute about 15% of the overall armed opposition, in which there are approximately 100,000 fighters. How many of the radicals would want to carry out the jihad outside of Syria's borders is certainly smaller than this number would suggest. And certainly some portion of the overall Islamist numbers uh, that is, those fighting under the banner of Islam are doing so on a purely transactional basis. Nevertheless, the structure of the opposition has complicated prospects for outside support. There is a generalized international enthusiasm for regime change, but not for a new caliphate. Rule six. 
The war has the potential to redraw boundaries within Syria as the Kurdish areas pursue autonomy. A Sunni Jazeera kind of an enclave erases the Iraq-Syria border, or at least muddies it, and an Alawi enclave takes shape in the West. Because the population there in particular is mixed, one might anticipate a degree of ethnic cleansing if and when the lines stabilize and the two sides begin to consolidate their positions. So the violence will continue, arguably, um, but on a more particularistic and localized basis on either side of an established uh, de facto uh, border. Seven, although civil wars in the Middle East tend to draw outsiders in, they have not historically spilled over in ways that fundamentally threaten the viability of neighboring states. There is, however, a massive humanitarian outflow that challenges the stability of Lebanon. On the other hand, Turkey, Israel, and Iraq can take care of themselves. Indeed, Israel has apparently taken swift advantage of anarchic conditions in Syria to interdict shipments of advanced weapons to Hezbollah. And Jordan is backed by its friends, for whom Hashemite control of that country remains a strategic priority. According to some analysts, the violent spectacle to Jordan's north has had a chilling effect on the Islamist opposition in Jordan and consequently strengthened the position of its pro-Western government. Rule, num <coughs> excuse me, rule number eight. Syria has not been a place outside powers, with the exception of Iran, wanted to go. One can lament the unwillingness of parliaments and publics to see their governments intervene in Syria, but that is the situation at this time. Endless war is not something voters want, and wobbly governments are not inclined to defy their constituencies on this point. The Iraq war has cast a long shadow. Yet even in France, which declined to involve itself in Iraq, the public has not been enthusiastic about intervention. Now this said, in terms of government decision making, hesitation regarding the use of force, at least in the United States, did not hinge solely on the issue of war weariness. The issue there was that the costs of involvement could be anticipated, and anticipated to be very high. The Iraq and Afghanistan wars, for example, are thought to have cost $4 trillion. While the cost of inaction to the U.S. of avoiding military intervention could not be specified. To complicate matters, it proved difficult for policy planners to develop a strategy for military intervention that would convincingly pave the way to a negotiated outcome. The regime was assessed as too intransigent and the opposition too fractured. So in the absence of some tangible sense of the price the US would pay for adopting a more restrained posture, the inability to connect the use of force to a favorable political outcome, except in the most general conceptual terms, the prospect and the prospect of a deepening proxy war with Iran against the background of a looming confrontation over its nuclear program, on top of the absence of a legal authority and the overt support of others, especially in the Arab world, a decision to attack the Syrian regime was going to be unlikely. Thus, containment, coupled to humanitarian assistance, the coordination of aid to the opposition, and strong support to Syria's vulnerable neighbors seemed to be the most sensible if unsatisfying course to take. Now, of course, we know that CW has changed this to some extent. It was a miscalculation by the Assad regime. Uh, he proved to be an unreliable adversary for the United States and Great Britain. He exceeded his brief. Uh, and in the event, CW used jammed both Washington and Moscow and compelled both to focus on the situation. Now, the current, um, uh, the current state of play offers the hope of a renewed diplomatic process. At worst, uh, if a ceasefire takes hold, it will precipitate a new equilibrium at a lower level of violence. This will save lives and potentially buy time for political progress. 
Rule number nine. Uh, uh, Saudis and Qataris uh, in particular could be tempted to take advantage of an interim ceasefire to help shore up opposition formations, replenish their weapon stocks, and help favored opposition groups to consolidate their positions in anticipation of renewed fighting. Iran and Hezbollah will be tempted to do the same on their side of the line. Finally, rule number 10. Uh, the U.S.-Russia uh, deal serves the interests of both countries, and if I'm right about lower levels of violence as a possible consequence, it, uh, the deal also serves the interests of the Syrian people as well. Uh, for the U.S., um, uh, this deal gets America and Russia back on track diplomatically, enables another press of the reset button, it delays or obviates the requirement for a military response that from Washington's view would not hasten an end to the conflict. It will reduce the tempo of fighting within Syria and possibly begin a return of refugees to Syrian territory. And it could begin the process of controlling Syria's CW stockpile, which for the United States was the priority from the very outset. Whether this process can be used to institutionalize a ceasefire and facilitate a political process, no one yet knows. But I expect that the U.S. and hopefully Russia, in coordination with other interested in Arab and Western capitals, will try their best.